I mentioned this morning uh, that <laughs> there will be nothing to mail out for the month of January. And I told Lisa that, and she uh, said they've already printed off, I don't know how many Sunday sermon discs, um, Bible study CDs, they, they print them before um, we record them. And um, so now we have to put a, she said, what, do you, what are we going to do? Maybe we can put a note in the thing that tells people, sorry, nothing for January. There was um, last Sunday's sermon that I preached uh, in the church in Turkana. Um, they did get that uh, recorded. Um, somebody was holding uh, Michael's phone, uh, holding it there on me and recording that. Uh, I haven't got to watch it yet. It's still moving over from Michael's phone to my phone. Um, but I'll release that as soon as I can get it out and um, we'll just stick that in with February so uh, and um, let's see here brother um, Chuck uh, preaching for you last Sunday uh, I heard a little bit of that and was amen in him so all right, Ephesians chapter 5, um, getting close to the end of the book of Ephesians. Um, so anyway, let's start in verse 1. I'll read the first two verses and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Um, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. I want you to think about that for a minute and um, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you Lord for your word. Thank you for the word this morning that you gave to us. I thank you, Lord, for the word that you have in waiting for us this afternoon. Lord, I, I thank you, God, for what it says, what it means. And Lord, how you're going to apply it in various ways in our life. Father, I pray that everything that we do would be to you a sweet smelling savor. And God, that you would uh, find in us Father, our love for you, our love for your salvation and the gospel, our love for your word, our dedication and devotion to the word of God, to the preaching of the word of God, to the ministry of Jesus, to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and everything, God, that you do for those, Lord, who follow you and things, God, that you do for people who don't follow you. Who are blessed living on this wonderful earth that you've given us. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would uh, open their eyes, open our eyes as well. And uh, Lord, help us to be made partakers in the ministry that Christ has. And let our sacrifices and the things that we do be unto you as Christ's sacrifice was unto you a sweet smelling savor father bless your word tonight open our eyes we pray in jesus name and all of god's people said amen i want you to ponder that for a minute um open your um we're going back to revelation chapter one again that just what's popped into my mind real quick and um understand that um i I just believe what the Bible says and whether it whether some people say well that's symbolic that's not literal and so on and so on okay if that's your position that's fine I find a lot more excitement in the literal or understanding something in a literal way than I do merely in the symbolic way um, 
in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that they kicked him off basically the planet and pushed him out of the way so that the word of God was in John. And John, just like we, uh, seek to be a distributor of the word of God. To let it, let it come out of us and go to places. And I just, I just tend to believe that we will be, or could very well be, as John was, segregated out, moved over, isolated because we're dangerous we're dangerous because we believe the bible and um you was it you that sent me the article um congressman um jim jordan um has requested uh i think it's an fbi somebody who's involved in the um looking after terrorist money financial something part of our government where they're looking into how terrorist money moves you know from place to place looking for uh the next 9 11 they say or whatever uh that sounds good but they're also using it and this is what congressman jordan is going to be looking into he's going to ask some questions because it looks like that they're tracking the financial movements of Americans, American citizens. And they start out, did you go to uh, Dick's Sporting Goods? Did you go to Bass Pro? Did you buy a gun there? Okay, did you buy a bow and arrow there? Did you buy ammunition there? Did you buy camping supplies, survival gear? Did you buy those things there? And then, then they march over and they Look at, did those same people also buy a Bible somewhere? Well, hey, remember the uh, Branch Davidians? They all had a Bible and they all had guns. And they were so dangerous, we had to burn them all up, including the children. I'll never get over that. Now, I've, listen, David Koresh was a pervert. He was a false prophet, and uh, those people could have, he had those people in so much bondage that they literally could have left at any time, but Koresh told them if they left that compound that they would not be in God's glory nor his saving grace, and uh, that they would burn in hell. And so he basically sealed their doom. That does not give the government the right to shoot on women and children, innocent women and children. It does not give them a right to do that. And uh, it's, it's just, it makes me angry when I think about it. Um, like I say, there was a lot going wrong there. But then American citizens have rights. And they have a right not to be shot and fired upon if they didn't do anything wrong. They have a right not to be shot or fired upon by their government. They have that right. And um, so anyway, there were some people, there were some innocent people that were killed in that place. And I'll just throw this in there because I'll never forget it. And I'm not going to let anybody else forget it. Every single alcohol tobacco and firearms agent that was killed in the initial raid on the branch civilian compound what started it all every one every agent that was killed just happened to be a former bill clinton bodyguard working for the arkansas state police that's a it's a fact it is a fact 
You can, you can, I've known it for years. You can look up their names and follow them. And they were all Bill Clinton, Arkansas State Patrol bodyguards that got transferred to a higher position for their service. And how is it that only the Bill Clinton bodyguards were killed on that initial raid and none of the other ATF agents were killed? Only those were killed. Okay? It's a fact. And um, I'm, I'm never going to let that go. I don't talk about it much, but it is a fact. Okay? Uh, very quickly... Uh, we found out just the other day, well, it was uh, February 2nd, um, just days after we leave Kenya, after we leave Nairobi, there's an explosion at a uh, gas distributor plant, which is, uh, I asked Michael and he said it was north, way north of the airport. It'd be, it'd be like the difference between Jefferson County and St. Peter's, okay? Uh, is a rough estimate of how far it was away from where we were, Chris. Uh, so we wouldn't have been in any danger had it happened while we were there. But the bottom line is that plant, that distributor plant, was operating illegally. They were not supposed to be in operation. They were not supposed to be in business because they had serious safety concerns. And the reason why they were still operating and distributing gas was because they were paying off and bribing officials who had the power to shut them down, officials who inspected the plant, they, they bribed them. Uh, and I, I know that one of the articles said that they had already arrested somebody in relation to that explosion that killed, I don't know how many people's dead so far, it was three as of February, the day that it happened. And they had about 300 people that were um, uh, injured by it from living in that area. And, and there were shopping places around that place and so on. Uh, you'll, when, you go to, when you go to Kenya, you'll find that there's not really a lot of... Uh, the way things laid out don't make sense. Because you'll have... Uh, you'll have um, oh slums right next to where some of the most wealthy people in Nairobi live, and it'll be surrounded by slums, and there's just that's just how it is. But uh, that's the corruption that exists over there, and it's the corruption that we have to deal with all the time when we go over there. It's very very corrupt. You can you can pay off government officials very easily it happens all the time and now it's cost people their lives and uh, I hope the government officials who were paid off I hope they get busted too I don't think anybody should get away with that but in our country we like to think that that doesn't take place but it does it takes place right you remember what I told you yeah I can't tell that publicly out loud but yeah all right, Ephesians 5, let's get into the Word of God. Be ye therefore followers of God as what? Dear children, remember, you are a child of God. You are a son of God. You, we are sons and daughters of God our Father. And I mean literally, because we are born again. That, does not, again. that phrase, born again, is not a metaphor for your mind. It is a literal happening it has taken place on the inside of us and it is, we, we are, or what is inside of us, that new man that is in us is a son of God, doubt it not. Okay, John wrote about uh, us being sons of God. Paul wrote about us being sons of God. And that's what he's implying here. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. This is your father. Follow in his footsteps. Do what he does. Follow what he says. Listen to him. Go read the book of Proverbs. You'll find Proverbs is written from a father to his son. Son, follow in my wisdom. What I tell you to do, 
Listen to your father. Listen to your dad. Listen to your mother. Oh, please listen to your mother. Okay, listen to what she says. Do what she tells you to do. Be a wise son. Be a, be a, be a wise uh, child. Don't, don't go against what your father and what your mother is trying to tell you to do. And he says, and walk in love uh, as Christ also. I told you to go to Revelation and I wasn't done reading there. But anyway, I'll get to it. As, as Christ also hath loved us. And here's what I was getting at. And gave himself for us an, an offering and a sweet and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. What I was getting to in Revelation 1 was when John saw him. Uh, he's the Lamb of God. Um, when it says here in verse uh, 14, and his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Um, but anyway, if you look over then in Revelation 5, the reason why his hair is like wool is it because he's the Lamb. In verse 6 of Revelation 5, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Capital L. People will say, well, that's a metaphor. It's a name for Christ. Well, is he the lamb or not? Okay. And as, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. I believe that literal. I believe that's literal. He has seven horns. He has seven eyes. And they both represent the seven spirits of God. Now, uh, who was that guy? Bear, Bear Grylls. That's who I was thinking of. Uh, if you remember the, him, he had a show on Discovery Channel. He was the survivor. Okay. And uh, he was somebody that was, he was a British uh, army person. I don't know what, he, what exactly he was. But he was special forces with Great Britain. He had been taught survival skills. Uh, he had been taught various things. Uh, he was taught that if you find yourself uh, inside an enemy country and you're a hundred kilometers away from, the, from a safe border, uh, if you learn some skills, you, sh you, could, you could possibly get, out, get yourself out of that situation, out of that country, over into a safe border but you may have to compromise some things in your head uh, in order to survive including and I'll never forget this one picking up a big loaf he was in Kenya picking up a big huge loaf of fresh elephant dung squeezing the water out of it into his mouth I will never forget that as long as I live here's why I bring his name up uh, you know, he he tries to kill certain animals that he knows would be in the area for food. He doesn't have a problem killing a snake. If he finds a snake, he can kill a snake. And he'll cut the meat out of it, eat the meat. And um, I won't go from there. But anyway, um, I remember one time he caught a skunk. And, of course, first thing he did was try to cut out that, that scent pouch that they have on the rear end. Um, even being successful in trimming off that scent pouch on that skunk, he stuck that skunk on a spit that he had made and cooked it over an open fire and was eating it and he's it's the worst he said that was one of the worst things he'd ever eaten and i'm going this guy's eating he goes digging through logs and pulling out big grub worms about like that and let them mush out of his mouth but he eats a skunk and here's my point don't ask me to eat skunk okay we took uh Chris to carnivore and I told him there's some things here you will want to try and some things you better not and I'll leave it at that um, but don't cook a skunk and tell me it's beefsteak because I'm pretty sure I can tell the difference 
Uh, he said the smell of it just while cooking was awful. And he had to make himself, uh, the point of it was he had to make himself eat this thing for, for some nourishment, some protein value to get out of it so he could make his way out of the forest or whatever it was. And it's entertaining, but after he ate the skunk, we know that he went to a place off camera and ate Twinkies and yeah, French fries and all that stuff. But anyway, here's my point with this. When you think of taking an animal and sacrificing it, What's interesting to me is that the very animals that God had in the list of animals that was to be brought to the tabernacle to be burned on the altar, that or a portion of it uh, to be cooked in, in water, to be boiled. Um, the idea was, number one, this is a, a, a burnt sacrifice uh, number two this is food now that we're going to give to the Levites for their sustenance and they brought in rams they brought in lambs goats they brought in cattle of various kinds uh, they brought in birds that were clean birds they were eligible to be eaten and understand that this was how the Levite priests received their livelihood was from uh, not just the money offerings that were brought, the shekels, but also um, the animal sacrifices. And if you remember, Hophni and Phinehas, who were um, Eli's... Was it Hophni and Phinehas? Yeah. Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's son. Eli was the high priest, and his sons were sitting out the gate to the, to the tabernacle, uh, defiling the tabernacle. They, they were... Um, they would just reach in and take whatever they had a flesh hook, God said, and they'd just reach in and take whatever they wanted out of the boiling pan that they had. Uh, or they would take whatever portion of flour or whatever portion of olive oil that they wanted, whatever. They were stealing. They were stealing food. They were pro and they were also enticing the young ladies that were coming with their families to the tabernacle. And it got to the point to where no, no man would dare take his family to the tabernacle to do what God commanded them to do. No man who is in his right mind would ever do that if Hophni and Phinehas were sitting there at the gate because he knows that they're going to try to, he's going, they're going to try to defile his daughters and they're going to end up stealing what he brings in anyway. So how is that going to benefit me with God if a portion of, or almost all or all of what I bring into God is stolen by them? And so it really, it, God, God got him. God got Hophni and Phinehas. God got Eli for that. Um, he told Eli, he said, "That's it's the your line in the priesthood ends with you, bud. And I'm going to take your line out of it, and I'm going to put a new line in." Well, that's where Samuel got involved. And when the Bible says that these animals, and I know we maybe not have thought this way, were a sweet smelling that Christ was a sweet smelling savor. There is a difference when I pass by some restaurant or somebody's house and I can tell they're having a barbecue. And if they're barbecuing, if they've got pork steaks on the grill, you can tell by the smell. And if they've got beef steaks on there, T-bones or porterhouse or New York strip or ribeyes or whatever, if they've got beef steak on there, buddy, I just almost stop and say, hey, invite me to your dinner. I love a good steak. Amen. Why is it? It's because when it's cooked, it smells amazing. Even if you don't add a bunch of spices and, you know, salt and things like that, even if you don't spice it up, which there's nothing wrong with that, but even if you don't do that, just the cooking of, of beef over an open fire is an amazing. Alicia said it when we went to Burger King. She said, oh, that smells good. No, that wasn't you. That was Lindsay. It was Lindsay that said that. Alicia said, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I said that or not. Yeah. But anyway, there are animals that when they are cooked over a fire, they smell wonderful. 
Now think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. Because the animals were to be consumed by the priest, they were to be eaten. Uh, the Passover lamb was cooked, and God said to Moses, eat all of it. Don't leave any of it laying around. Don't. It's not for leftovers. Eat the whole thing. And they were to consume that lamb on the evening of Passover. And as an enticement to eat the lamb of the first year, uh, which would probably be a very tender piece of meat, no matter what you got, uh, as an enticement to that, as they're burning it or cooking it or roasting it, it smells good. It has sweet smelling savor. And I want you to think about this, that everything that was brought in to be sacrificed or to be given over to God, aside from the money that was brought in, everything that people brought in was something that you eat. It was all for the eating of the Levite priest. And so God is taking now Christ, who was offered for us as a sacrifice to God, and it was a sweet smelling savor which means that it smelled wonderful it smelled good it wasn't a big piece of skunk or rat yeah uh, uh snakes i don't know if i've had snake i've had crocodile that's pretty good did you get any crocodile i think you did i'm not sure but anyway, crocodile's not bad, okay? Uh, but anyway, there's a difference between skunk and steak, is, and steak is what I'm telling you tonight. And there's a place in the scripture, I have it in my notes, I probably won't get there tonight. But where Paul, in fact, let me go there, let me see if I can find it. Yeah. Turn to 2 Corinthians 2, and I'll... We'll just follow in this direction tonight. I'll get into the, some of the other sacrifices uh, next Sunday. But let me get to the point here tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I like this. Man, I like this passage. It's just a wonderful, wonderful promise that God has made to us. And, and God blesses us this way. Now remember that Christ is a sweet smelling savor. And his sacrifice were a sweet, it, they smelled sweet. And by the way, um, also in the tabernacle, there was burning incense. Now, there is difference between the smell of incense and the smell of a cigarette, right? There's a difference. One of them smells good and it, it is a sweet smell. Most incense is a sweet smell. Cigarettes, tobacco is not a sweet smell. It's awful. Um, you know, if you're, I remember going on visitation one night years ago when I was a teenager, went with a guy in our church and we went to a family's house. And I think I've told this, but the, the mom and the dad both were heavy smokers. And the daughter that, that we went to school with, Jerry, I won't give her name out, but uh, anyway, the daughter was, she was an adult by then and she was a heavy smoker and her sister was a heavy smoker and her husband was there. He was a heavy smoker and me and Ted were sitting in this guy's house talking to him about coming back to church and I mean, they're all lighting up and I think they're doing it now after a while. I think they're doing it to get rid of us because I mean, they're all just puffing away and just puffing as hard as they can and light up another one and the whole house just... And I'm like, oh, let's get out of here. And uh, looked like me and Ted was on fire as we come out of that house. Okay, smoke still coming off of us. One smells good, one doesn't. Now, thanks be to God, 2 Corinthians 2.14, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. What does that say? Does it say that sometimes we don't triumph? No. It says it al always, God always causes us to triumph in Christ. Means that you never lose. Even, 
Even when you've done something stupid. Even when you've done something you think, man, I thought that sin was gone years ago. God still triumphs in us. God doesn't lose. We're never going to lose. Now, it may cost us something. If we do something wrong, it may cost us something. In fact, it probably will. There's probably going to be a reckoning from God. There's going to be uh, a chastisement from God. He may take something away from us. But I promise you, give it about 5, 10, 15, 20 years or however long it takes God. And I promise you, maybe the thing that God took away from you end up being the worst thing that could have ever happened to you. Now, listen, I've seen that with God too in my life. Okay? And God just took things away and I just, I'm going, God, well, why did you do this, God? Lo and behold, years later, found out it was the best thing that could have happened. Okay? God was sparing me. God was helping me. He was causing me to triumph. But I didn't know it at the time. I thought I'd lost. But you never lose in Christ. Never do. And maketh manifest, here it is, the savor. Same word, savor of his knowledge by us in every place. That means that when we, when we are out away from this church and every place, how many places did he say? Every place or some places? Every place maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. That God will... To those who love the Lord and those who love the word of God, when we say things and when we talk and we speak of the word of God, it goes forth from us like, like incense. And the people around us, when they hear the things that we are saying from the word of God, they receive that because it smells good to them. In their soul, it is a sweet-smelling savor to them. And they don't, it don't bother them. It don't bother them for, for you to talk about the Word of God. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't bother any of those pastors, Chris, either in Samburu or Turkana. Did not bother any of those guys to come and to hear the Word of God talk to them. I'll never forget that guy. He did. He took his Bible and held it up to him. And he said, 66. He just loved it. And uh, I'll never forget that. That blessed my heart. That man's going to take what he learned. He's going to try to apply that. He's going to try to uh, feed from that and feed his people off of that. And um, so if you're talking to somebody or just around other people who are saved, I'll tell you what, you just, it just, it's a blessing to be around God's people. Amen. You, you just can't get enough of God's people. But uh, to those who perish, now look at this. He said, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. We have two smells, two savor, savors that come off of us. Verse 16, to the one we are the savor of death unto death. And, and let's get honest, death smells different than life, doesn't it? Death smells, death is horrible. That's how you know that maybe somebody the police go into a house as a welfare check they can tell right away if somebody's dead in there I mean that smell permeates every place I had to help pick up a guy that had been dead for four days one time and uh, I say I had to I was kind of interested until I got to the front door the Jefferson County deputy that was sitting out by his patrol car, he's sitting on the hood of his patrol car. He tells who I'm with, he says, uh, unless you see a gun or a knife anywhere within a few feet of this man's body, I don't really want to go back in there again. So he said, unless you see obvious signs of a struggle or foul play, he said, I'm not going back in there. And I will tell you, I, I stayed fairly far away from the man's body. He'd been in there four days in the summertime. 
the TV was left on, you know, all kinds of things. And what happened was the neighbors, this guy lived alone. He didn't have anybody around as family or anything like that. And what happened was the neighbors started smelling outside of his trailer house, started smelling something and they're going, oh no. So they called the sheriff and, and we went in there. But that smell, I couldn't get it out of my nose for days. And I wasn't near as affected by it as the person I was with. But that's just the thing there. To, the reason why lost people don't want to be around saved people. Is we smell like death to them. We are a, we are a, mind, a mindful thing to them of their own perishing. To be around you reminds them that they're not ready to meet and stand before God. And they may talk themselves into it and think that they are outside of their contact with you, but just being around you, to them, you are a savor of death. Because maybe they know you and they know you're you go to church and you read the Bible and you believe it and they've seen the change in your life and while secretly they admire that they don't want they don't want part of it they love their sin more than they love anything else so they don't want you around because you smell like death to them but he said to the other the savor of life unto life those even lost people those who are looking for Christ and looking for the gospel and looking for everlasting life uh, when they get around us, they don't, they like it. God allows them to smell from us a sweet smelling savor. And again, it's the difference between, I hate to put it this way, but it's the difference between incense and a cigarette. In the tabernacle, there was an altar of incense inside right before the Ark of the Covenant. So here you have the, you have the table of showbread here on the north and you have the, the candlestick here on the south. And to the west, before the veil, was another altar, but it was intended only for incense. And that represented the prayers of God's people. Coming up to God, smoke rises, and the incense, go, we read this in Revelation 2, um, the smoke goes up, that is a, a symbol of our prayers going before God. And our prayers to God are a sweet-smelling savor to Him. He, God likes it when we pray. God likes it when we pray to Him. Amen. He likes us spending time with Him, talking to God, confessing our sins, telling God what's going on, telling God that we things we worry about, telling God thank you for what He's done in our life. Those things, God loves that because that smells good to Him. Other people like being around you, even if they're not saved, they probably will at some point be saved. I know somebody right now that is is going through that, and I've been praying for him, and praying for him, praying for him, and I was told uh, the other day that uh, he's this particular person is kind of kind of working toward the big crossover, coming to the Lord Jesus for his salvation. You don't know who I'm talking about, so just pray for whoever Mike Hoggard's talking about, all right? Just pray for that person. But anyway, he says to the other, verse 16 again, the savor of life and the life. And he said, who is sufficient for these things? In other words, who can generate that on their own? Who, who is it among us that can, without God's help, generate a, a sweet-smelling savor to people or the opposite to others? Who in us can do that? I can't. God must do it in us. Christ must do it for us. And God must do it in us and through us. For we are, verse 17, for, oh, look at this. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So the corruption of God's word was already well in place. By the time Paul came around, in other words, he's, he's barely getting into writing the New Testament. And he said, already they're corrupting it. Paul, Paul told everybody at the end of the book of Acts, he said, I know that after my departure, after I'm gone, 
grievous wolves are going to enter in, not sparing the flock. Uh, and he talked about hi, uh, people like Hymenaeus and Philetus. He said, whose words doth eat as a canker or a cancer. It's what, literally what it says. Their words will eat just like cancer eats and just takes and takes and takes and doesn't give anything back. And he's, it's all about the corruption of the word of God, taking the word of God and, and taking words out of it, putting words back into it or changing the words and then changing the meaning of the words. One of the things that um, we see uh, that has taken place, let's say in the last 60, 70 years, uh, of Bible doctrine and the doctrine of the Bible is uh, how many of you have a Strong's Concordance? Okay, my mom got one. I think I have it. Um, but anyway, it's, it was it was a good tool to use. Still is. There's nothing wrong with it. But it was a concordance of every word in the King James Bible and what that word meant. That talk about the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic. It was, it was a dictionary and a concordance and a list of every word in the King James and what those words meant. So the scholars figured out years ago, well, if we can't, if we can't really uh, just get away with taking stuff out of the Bible or whatever, what we need to do is rewrite the concordance to change what the Greek word means. See how sneaky the devil is? All you got to do is alter the dictionary. Change what the word means. And when you do that, when you're, it's like Bill Clinton saying, what is, is. What does the word is mean? And that's stupid. But he was looking for a legalistic word game way out of the trouble that he was in. He was looking for that as a lawyer. Remember, that's what he was. And uh, But anyway... Um, they started changing the concordances and the, and the Greek and Hebrew definitions so that when scholars came later to take the word of God in hand and then to translate that word of God into English, they're not only getting corruption from the corrupt manuscripts, they're getting corruption now from the corrupted dictionaries. What do the words mean? There is a gift of interpretation of tongues that God gives to man and then there is Babel the language of Babel where it says we don't know what it means but we're going to change it because we don't like what it says we're going to alter it we're going to change it and so any we, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God but as of sincerity but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ so it all has to do with the things that you say to people and what you tell people you can tell people you can go around telling people yeah i go to i go to such and such church or i go to bethel church or whatever and that mac that pastor mike he's a pretty good preacher i i just you know he just says some things that i i i disagree with and um uh, i tell you he he just doesn't get the bible right and i don't think he's got the education that I really, I've had people say that, but anyway, they just, he's not really educated like I, like I need in my life. And, and uh, by the way, he's wrong about some, some of the words. I know the King James is a good Bible, but it's wrong about some things it says because the dictionary, the concordance has changed now. And we all know we have a better grasp on the Greek and a better understanding of the Hebrew words now and, and, and we're going to go with that. We're going to follow that. You go around telling everybody that about Bethel Church and then don't, don't, don't invite them to church. Uh, because, well, I'd, I would say invite them to church because what they're going to do is they're either going to say, yeah, you're right. We heard that. We, yeah, we don't like that, Mike. We don't, we don't like Bethel Church. We're not ever going back there ever again. Or they may just say, you know what? I think I found out who's lying here. And I've had that happen as far as the videos that we put out. Some guy decided he was going to go after me and call me out to be a big, major false prophet. And, uh, I mean, he made, he, what he did was he called me on the phone and caught me off guard. And made me say something that I really didn't, I wasn't comfortable with saying it the way 
the way he had me worded. I don't remember what it was. But then he called me back and he's recording it again. And he catches me. He waits about six months till I forget what I said to him. And when he said, because you said such and such this, I said, I never said anything like that. I don't believe that. And he said, I got you. He was just waiting for me. I got you. I got you. I got you recorded on that. And, I and he made another video and played both things. And somebody wrote in the comments, he said, you know, before this video, I didn't know who Mike Hoggard was. But I went to see and watch some of his videos. Now that I've watched him, I now know who's lying. I know who the false teacher is. It ain't Mike. And uh, so I, I welcome the, the, the bad advertisement. Anyway, um, every place you go, remember, there is a savor coming off of you. And people are going to think of you that you are to them about death or you are to them about life. And if you want people to follow you into the kingdom of God. And I don't mean follow you in your teachings. I mean walk with you as we go to the pearly gates. If you want people to follow your life into heaven's gates, please be a saver of life and the life to them. Say the things that are right to them. Say them in love. You can tell that you can speak the truth to people, but hate their guts doing it. And speak it in such a way as you hope that they reject you so you can feel glorified in God's sight. God accepted me, but he don't accept them because they didn't do what I said to do. And there's people like that everywhere, especially in fundamentalism. They're just waiting to catch you say something slightly wrong. And they're going to nail you for it. Well, those people you can't help. But to everybody else... Be a saver of life. Be something. Don't be a skunk. And don't be a cigarette. Amen. Be a, be a beef steak porterhouse steak on the grill. Amen. Amen. Sirloin. Deer tenderloin. Mmm. Yeah. Let's stand to our feet.